Hi church, so good to be with you today for our digital devotion. Our Board of Mission and Social Action decided to do a really cool project a few months ago. They wanted to support a new organization that was trying to respond to the unique needs of COVID-19. We've seen how much this pandemic has damaged communities with people losing jobs, with people having less income, with homelessness on the rise, and so they wanted to respond to that by supporting an organization that's on the front lines of doing this work. So they put out a request for proposals and we got some incredible proposals from different organizations. And uh, actually behind the scenes, we're supporting several of the proposals, <laughs> uh, but the one that was awarded the first grant of $1,000 to uh, support their work is something called Westlake Community Table, which is in Los Angeles and is trying to help those who are without home have a lot of options for resources and what's cool about this organization is that they partner with other local groups so that the produce that they have is locally grown so that they are supporting businesses that are owned by people of color and women of color and so there's just a lot of great work being done by Westlake they put together a little video yeah to teach us about their work and if you want to join them in what they do on a weekly basis, please let us know. We can put you in contact with the organizers. Yeah. So let's take a take look. Take a look. Elevate the ties, babe. There's no way, there's no way I could fall. When I'm in this state of mind, baby. There's no name but your name I would call. organizations, various like tenants unions. Um, we let people know about the shower pole, but we would like to provide more services. We have individual volunteers who kind of work as unofficial caseworkers to like transport people to shelters. Um, one of our unhoused comrades, he's also like been helping the table and he is very happy in a shelter right now. Though we do understand some unhoused folks may not like shelters. So to really consider everyone's like personal needs, we try to use our connections to get people like tents, tarps, etc. Um, I guess in terms of services, that is our main ones. Um, there are also times in which there are people who have like really deep cuts and we do do our best to like like sanitize it and like provide the bandaging. Um, though, you know, we are just volunteers, we're not like medical experts. I'm over question now, baby, you know exactly who Good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship on Palm Sunday. I remember so distinctly that it was a year ago, and we were making jokes about how this felt like the Lent where we had to give the most up that we've ever had to give up. But here we are in a space where it almost feels as if we've had a Lenten year, not just 40 days. That there has been much we have given up, but also I hope so much that we have taken in. Lessons learned, new relationships built, relationships strengthened, and a new perspective on crossing this threshold of going into some sort of better normal. It has been such an honor to create that better normal and not just a new normal with all of you over this last year 
And we have spent this Lenten season in what we have called a season of recovery, looking at the holy fragments of our lives. We have seen that the stories of Jesus' healing ministry are filled with both words and deeds. That when Jesus rides into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, the people had hopes that he would heal this oppressive system that they were living under. We know that his healing was not confined just to that moment in history, but that it offers a new way of life that has made a case of compassion for all, especially the least, ever since that time thousands of years ago. And so as we head into the events of Holy Week, we begin to see that our ability to forgive ourselves and others is a foundation that can transform our own diseases and allow us to move forward. We integrate our beliefs and our actions because our complete physical and spiritual health is important. The parade of compassionate power that we will celebrate today is underscored by another healing story of transformation symbolizing our own ability to initiate our own recovery. Will you join me in our call to worship? Jesus rode before the people on a donkey, revealing the kind of king he is, a humble, kind leader who meets us where we are and invites us into living grace filled lives. As we worship together this day, may we be willing to follow Christ in this parade of humility and generosity. Let us proclaim that true power and strength come when we set ourselves free. Join us in our opening hymn, All Glory, Laud, and Honor. If you picked up one of our palm crosses this week, now is the time to wave them as we shout Hosanna. Sing with us. We have approached our time of confession each week in Lent in such a way that we lay bare our brokenness in order to start the process of healing. Along the way, we have acknowledged our need to restore our own holy fragments while also acknowledging our role in communal and global healing. This work of restoration will continue 
as we integrate all that we have learned with all that we will do going forward. Let us pray. Forgiving God, we have opened ourselves to healing, yet sometimes it is easier to pray nice prayers than do the hard work of putting those prayers into action. Help us remember the sacredness of the holy fragments that make us who we are, fragile and susceptible to further shattering, but also resilient and capable of transformation. Help us to see ourselves as you see us. Help us to believe in our ability to change and heal as you believe in us. Help us, healer. Show us our strength. Amen. This last Sunday before Easter, as we hear these words of assurance, we invite you to once again return to that warm orb of light that lives deep within you. So close your eyes. Imagine that warmth within you. It may already be aglow with the anticipation of Holy Week, but if you are struggling today, or if you have struggled in this season of recovery to feel this warmth of assurance inside you, do not despair. You are not the one who has to create the light. Instead, it exists within you as a gift from the divine. And when you are ready to become aware of it, you will find it within. Know this, you are never alone in the struggle. Jesus is on the journey with us. You are part of this body of Christ, a community seeking healing, and we are healing together. Amen. Earlier this month, we marked one year of digital worship services together. And each week, no matter how difficult our lives were, no matter how dark the outside world had become, and we see this darkness as hate against Asian, American, and Pacific Islander communities continue, we wish each other the peace of Christ, knowing that this peace transcends all understanding and that the peace of Christ is with us on this journey to recovery. So as our communities start to open more and more and we see a light at the end of this tunnel, today, once again, may we wish each other the peace of Christ and share in the chat where you found a moment of peace this week. May the peace of Christ be with you. Good morning, young friends. This is DJ, and I am here in our sanctuary today, which is Palm Sunday. This is the day where we remember Jesus's entry into the city of Jerusalem. What he did is he came down the road of Jerusalem. There were people and crowds on both sides of the road. And in this crowd, they were waving palm branches and they were laying them down in the street. 
And Jesus came riding up the street on a donkey, and he received the welcome from these people as they shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. You see, Jesus was receiving a king's welcome, but it was very different than what a normal king would receive. You see, Jesus's entry was much more humble, and it was much more simple. And he was going to be a king that was not what the people were expecting. A king that would give away power rather than keep it for himself. A king that would sacrifice for his followers rather than sacrifice his followers. And the ultimate sacrifice would be made just a few days later when he was killed on the cross. Uh, And so as we remember this triumphal entry into Jerusalem, as we remember the king that Jesus was, let us pray and thank God that this is a king that we can celebrate, a king that we want to follow, a king that ruled with love and mercy and compassion. Gracious and heavenly God, thank you that you are not a God who holds the power and who keeps the power from everyone else, but who instead gives to your followers a God who serves, a God who loves, a God who has compassion, a God who cares. Be with us as we remember this triumphal entry. Be with us as we prep for Easter uh, and we prep for the celebration that is your resurrection. Be with us, we pray. And all God's children said, Amen. And now we get to sing Hosanna together. Church, something incredibly exciting is happening right now. While those of you watching this worship service live during our premiere on Facebook and YouTube, we are also having, right as I speak, our first in-person, outdoor, physically distanced, masked worship service. People are gathering together in pods, and we purchased a lot of new sound equipment to make this possible You can continue to register for future outdoor services on our website. Go to claremontucc.org. You'll find a place to register and sign up for outdoor worship services. All of this is only possible because of the continued generosity and giving of this congregation that allowed us to buy the equipment and electrical resources we needed to set up this outdoor worship service, to be able to have the technology in the sanctuary to have our digital worship services. We're grateful for you, and thank you for supporting Claremont UCC. Our gifts and our tithes will now be received. Some days I can't get myself out I can't find keys to any box Some days I feel like it's all overblown Then I look to you and I don't feel so alone And I say, hey, let your little light shine Let your little light shine I look 
pray with me? God of generosity, cultivate within us hearts that find joy in giving of ourselves and our resources for the growth and support of all. Amen. This past August, even during a pandemic, we welcomed a new class of members into our community here at Claremont United Church of Christ, a way for these people to declare that this was their church home, and we are so honored to have them with us. Well, today we welcome another group of new members, and we've prepared a special slideshow to introduce them to you. Take a moment and give a quiet word of thanks in the chat. Tell them that they are welcomed here, and when you get a chance to meet them in person once again, Will you please give them a generous word of welcome on behalf of this faith community? Welcome, new members.
Christ. Hear these contemporary words from Mother Teresa. We know only too well that what we are doing is nothing more than a drop in the ocean. But if the drop were not there, the ocean would be missing something. William James, act as if what you do makes a difference. It does. Our scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew chapter 8, verses 1 through 4. When Jesus had come down from the mountain, great crowds followed him. And there was a leper who came to him and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you choose, you can make me clean. He stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I do choose. Be made clean. Immediately, his leprosy was cleaned. Then Jesus said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. If you have enjoyed the Harry Potter books or movies, you know that there is much to love. A world of wizards and magic and mysterious creatures, the forces of good and evil battling it out, a boarding school full of friends and adventures and mysteries to be solved. But I think perhaps at the heart of that narrative is the hope we all have for Harry to discover his place in the world. The author J.K. Rowling does a brilliant job of setting this up for us in the very beginning. When we meet Harry, he's an orphan living with his cold, unloving aunt and uncle and their spoiled son. They mistreat him. They go out of their way to remind him that he's not really part of their family. And so on his 11th birthday, when Harry receives a letter of acceptance to the Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry, despite his aunt and uncle's many attempts to destroy that invitation, we are already rooting for him to escape his abusive context. We feel grateful, along with him, that he wasn't abandoned or forgotten, but has been carefully watched over by invisible guardians who eventually rescue him. So in addition to all of the fun wizard adventures in the world of Harry Potter, I think there is something about this storyline of being seen and recognized and chosen that has resonated so deeply across the world and made the entire series the phenomenon that it is. Isn't it true for each of us that at our core, we want to know that in the vast universe, a higher power is keeping an eye on us, caring about our comings and our goings, and perhaps most of all, listening and acting when we cry out for help. When we are going through difficult challenges, the most painful question is to wonder if God has abandoned us. And I think we feel this most acutely in times of crisis, when our children are being bullied in school, when our parents are rapidly declining in health, when our friends become ill, when all of our relationships are under duress, when we feel unfulfilled at work. That's when we find ourselves brought into a questioning period of our beliefs. We question our faith in a God who often feels distant and unknowable. For many of us, the entire last year has been one of these times. Yes, the pandemic brought all of this uncertainty into our world, but also our lives have gone on with the usual hardships. Loved ones have passed away, friends have relocated, children have grown up and moved out of the home, health problems have advanced. And in the midst of all that, maybe you found yourself at some point in the last 12 months asking, do you care about any of this, God? And if so, are you going to do something about it? Can you give me something, anything to reassure me that I'm not alone here? The story of the leper 
is so powerful because it tells us about a man who was outcast in his society. And it clearly illustrates Christ's public decision to break boundaries and customs in order to restore this man to holistic health and wellness. We're all familiar with leprosy. It was the general ancient term for contagious skin diseases that caused people to literally be cast out of their communities. There's actually a whole section in the book of Leviticus where God instructs Moses on how the Israelite community was supposed to handle cases of leprosy. And it involved, you know, bringing the infected person to a priest who had to examine them, and then they had to monitor the case for a week and come back to the priest who had to note any changes in the skin condition, examine all of their articles of clothing to see if that was infected, and it goes on and on. And if the person happened to be cured of the skin disease, then the priest would have to take two birds and kill one of them and dip the live bird in the blood of the dead bird and sprinkle it all over the former leper. Let me just say, I am really glad that that is not the current job description of clergy today. But the point is, leprosy was taken very seriously in Jesus' time, and likely that was initially for public health and safety reasons. But of course, there is this emotional component to it, and it becomes eventually less about safety and more about shunning these people. Social stigmas are very easy to create, and they're very hard to eradicate. For example, people with leprosy were required to verbally warn others in their vicinity that they were infected by calling out, unclean, 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 as they approached anyone. Can you imagine? No one would want to be within 10 feet of someone announcing they were unclean. We know this. We're living in the era of COVID. Uncleanliness makes us very, very uneasy these days. And so it is truly striking in this story that the leper approaches Jesus in the middle of a crowd, and instead of announcing that he is unclean, he kneels before him and professes his faith. He says, Lord, if you choose, I know you can make me clean. And even more striking is Jesus reaching out and touching the leper. That would have been totally forbidden. And it rendered Jesus himself unclean according to the purity laws of his community. But he does it anyway. And he crosses this very clear boundary. And he says, I do choose. I do choose. Be made clean. I wonder when I reread this story what it is exactly that Jesus is choosing. Is he simply choosing to heal in this unconventional way? Is he choosing to break a law because he knows it's the right thing to do? Is he choosing the leper? Or is he choosing God's way over the human way of doing things? I think it's all of the above. I think when Jesus chooses God's way, he decides to demonstrate to the crowd gathered there that God always chooses people over antiquated laws. God always chooses people over customs and traditions. God always chooses to heal and make us whole when we seek healing and wholeness. God always chooses to extend compassion and restore dignity, always. I recently started reading a book called All the Young Men about the life and legacy of a woman named Ruth Coker Burks. Perhaps you've heard of her or this book or you know this story. It's actually being turned into a film now. And I have to tell you, this story is absolutely stunning. The year was 1986. And a 26-year-old woman named Ruth is visiting a friend at the hospital in her hometown in Arkansas. And she notices that one of the rooms in the hospital has a red door. And she sees the nurses drawing straws to decide who's going to go in there and take care of that patient. 
And in, upon inquiring, Ruth finds out that the patient in the room has AIDS. And this was before we even knew what AIDS was. It was before it was even called AIDS. And she decides to go in the room. And she finds a young man crying out for his mother. And in an attempt to help him, Ruth gets the information and she calls the mother. And she discovers that due to the stigma of the AIDS virus, his mother is refusing to come and see him. And Ruth decides she's going to stay with this man and comfort him until he dies, which, as it turns out, is only 13 hours later. But even then, his mother refuses to come and claim his body. And so Ruth discovers that none of the local funeral homes will take him. And so what does she do? She pays for his body to be cremated, and she places the ashes in her own father's grave. And word spreads that there's one woman, there's one woman who's willing to nurse AIDS patients. No one else wants to do it. And so she's called again and again by hospitals and eventually by the patients themselves to be an advocate and a friend. And she works to find them houses and jobs and medication. She has to secretly network to get the medication they need, and she hides it in her home. She goes dumpster diving so she can get enough food to feed these people who are hungry. She begins teaching sex education as science reveals new information about the virus. And most importantly... Ruth befriends these people who have been discarded and shunned by society out of fear and misinformation and prejudice. In the end, Ruth cared for over 1,000 AIDS patients over the course of three decades. And she was often turned down by priests to conduct the funerals of these people, and so she did them herself. She buried more than 40 AIDS victims in her own family cemetery plot there in Arkansas. And ultimately, she went on to advise Bill Clinton how to manage the AIDS crisis, and she became a White House AIDS education consultant. There is a part of this story that is less inspiring, and that is the fact that Ruth and her daughter were cast out of their local community for doing this work. On two different occasions, the KKK burned crosses in their yard. She says the only way she was able to pay rent and buy that medication for her friends was because drag queens would put on shows and collect money for her. And after 1990 and the adoption of the Ryan White Care Act, Ruth had trouble finding work, and none of the local businesses would hire her. But here's an incredibly important fact to take away from this story. The patients that Ruth cared for lived around two years beyond the national average life expectancy for people diagnosed with AIDS at that time. It was so surprising that when the CDC and the National Institutes of Health found out about it, they sent researchers to study her method. Now, I think we can all look back at this story and say, we don't need extensive research and studies to discover her method. Her method was love. Her method was compassion. Her method was choosing to offer her friends the dignity and the support that they deserved. Ruth said, I knew that what I was doing was right. I knew that I was doing what God asked of me. It wasn't a voice from the sky. It was something I knew deep in my soul. The leper said, if you choose, you can make me clean. And Jesus said, I do choose. I do choose. Be made clean. And we see Jesus do this over and over again in his life and ministry. He looks at the lepers and the tax collectors and the poor and the injured. He looks at the sick and the Gentiles, the second-class citizens, the servants, 
the women, the children, the adulterers, the hungry crowds. And he looks at them and they call to him and they all say, if you choose, if you choose. And Jesus says over and over again, I do choose. I do choose. I do choose. And they're all healed. The child lives. The storm subsides. The lepers are made clean. Lazarus rises from the dead. The demons are cast out. The paralyzed can move again. The blind are given new vision. They are miracle stories with many layers and complexities, but at the heart of every healing story in the Gospels is Jesus choosing to love people no matter what. No matter what the law says, no matter what the community thinks, no matter what his own followers say. And we too are given choices every day. And those choices matter. The pandemic has taught us that lesson again and again. Our choices matter. Our choices can be the difference between life and death, between salvation and disaster, between connection and fragmentation. And when we choose one another, we align ourselves with Christ's way. When we choose to show compassion and love, we are simply choosing to do what Christ has already done. When we choose to advocate for the safety and the visibility of people who are seeking asylum in our country, to the people being detained at borders and put in detention facilities, we should remember that Jesus has already told them, I choose you. When we choose to support and assist people who are fighting to live paycheck to paycheck through this pandemic, when we choose to make sure that our buildings and facilities are accessible to all, we should remember that Jesus has already said to those people, I choose you. When we choose to defend and reassure people who were hurt by the Catholic Church's misguided, damaging statement about marriage, we should know that Jesus has already told them, I choose you. I do choose. I do choose. When we choose to speak out against racism and stand with our black and Asian American siblings who are being targeted due to the racist propaganda of our former president, we should remember that Jesus has already told all of those people, I choose you. I do choose. I choose you. If we are truly followers of Jesus, we have to choose compassion and love. We have to choose peace and wholeness. We have to choose inclusion. We have to choose dignity and kindness. We have to choose one another. We are faced with countless choices every day, which means we have countless opportunities to choose wisely and faithfully for one another and to remember that Christ chooses each of us every single time. Amen.
Amen. Amen. Will you pray with me, please? Healer of our every ill, especially when we find it difficult to believe or trust that sorrow will end, hear our cries for healing of body, mind, and spirit. Even when we struggle to understand it, we believe that you see beauty in our brokenness. We pray today for those who feel there is no end to sorrow, that no matter what we do or how hard we work to bring peace and justice to our world, it feels like we cannot gain traction. We give thanks that when we cannot bring ourselves to the healing source of your love, there are others around us who through their words and actions bring us hope once again. And so together we pray with one voice, great giver, in whom heaven is found, holy is your name. May your commonwealth of peace and freedom flourish on earth. Give us this day bread for our journey and make us hungry to see the whole world nourished. Forgive us and help us forgive one another. Strengthen us for the challenges that lie ahead. Let us hear your prophets and deliver us from our privilege. For your love is the only power, the only home, the only honor we need in this world and in the world to come. Amen. words of Jesus that we heard in this week's healing story were many, but let us focus on three in particular. I do choose. Healing is not always an absence of illness, but rather a belief that God is choosing us. God is healing us. By believing this, we participate in our own healing. We manifest divine healing in our lives. We obtain the power to overcome our hardships when we understand that Christ is for us. Christ is on our side. Christ wants us to be whole and healed. This week, as we walk through what we call Holy Week, you are invited to hold on to your sea glass to hold it to your heart and to say out loud, Christ chooses me. <laughs> 